This episode is generously sponsored by Hunt a Killer. In these ever-changing and unprecedented times, there are limited opportunities to experience a rush or thrill. And while I love me a good murder doc, when I want to break free from the many screens in my life, I know I can count on the contents of my Hunt a Killer box to keep me on the edge of my seat. Hunt a Killer is a monthly subscription box that brings the excitement and intrigue of true crime into your own home without the inconvenience or tedious cleanup of an actual murder. Hunt a Killer allows you to crack the case by investigating the contents of a series of boxes delivered right to your door. And for those who watch our channel hoping that victims and their families might soon see closure, you'll be happy to know that for every box purchased, Hunt a Killer donates to the Cold Case Foundation, an organization dedicated to helping solve real life crimes. I think we can all agree that the real world is scary enough. So kick back and hunt a killer from the safety of your own living room. For 20% off your first box, visit huntakiller.com slash Merck and enter promo code Merck today. Again, that's huntakiller.com slash Merck. And don't forget to enter the promo code M-E-R-C. Do you have what it takes to hunt a killer? Malibu, California is referred to as home by only the upper echelon of America's elite. And while well, the fast cars and vast mansions that decorate the scenic coastal town often leads to a false sense of entitlement by those who inhabit the coveted zip code, far more dangerous is the false sense of safety and security felt by outsiders who dare to trespass upon the hallowed grounds of Hollywood's high society. Four such outsiders to this deceptively beautiful locale were Matrice Richardson, 24, Elaine Park, 22, Tristan Baudet, 35, and Matthew Weaver Jr., 21. All happy young adults with promising futures cut short. In 2010, Matrice Richardson's body was found in Malibu's Dark Canyon, 10 months after she was negligently released from the Lost Hills Sheriff Station and disappeared. Then, Elaine Park went missing in the same Malibu region in January of 2017. In June of 2018, scientist Tristan Baudet was shot to death in front of his daughters while camping in the Malibu Creek campgrounds just six minutes from where Elaine's car was found. And in August of 2018, Matthew Weaver Jr. disappeared from the same spot. This secluded and scenic area known as Dark Canyon was turning out to be aptly named indeed. And while a nine-year span separates these four mysterious tragedies, until this tangled web is made clear by LA's supposed finest, a cloud of confusion and cover-up will continue to linger over the families and friends of those lost. The region these four individuals were lost or killed in is a popular hiking trail and driving loop, which doubles as a smoke spot for local teens and moonlights as a lover's lane. This scenic canyon in LA County is located in the ritzy hills of Malibu, and while it's only eight minutes from the freeway, as its namesake would indicate, the inky blackness of the hillsides of Dark Canyon are every bit as obscure and impenetrable as the law enforcement agencies tasked with protecting them. Because, as everyone in showbiz will tell you, the brighter a light shines, the darker a shadow it casts. The first young life tragically cut short in Dark Canyon was Matrice Richardson. Graduating from California State University Fullerton with a BA in Psychology in 2008, Matrice Richardson had her entire life ahead of her with which to learn to balance her obvious intelligence with what can be a highly intrusive and difficult to treat mental illness, that of bipolar disorder. 
the manifestations of which can be deceptively unpredictable and sporadic in nature. Residing in LA, Matrice deviated from her usual leisure activities when she went, alone, to a swanky upscale restaurant in Malibu and ordered a steak. Although she sat alone, she made attempts to talk with a nearby party, eventually joining their table, albeit somewhat to the attendees' surprise. But her colorful and upbeat attitude mollified the other party members, and they chatted away with Matrice. However, they soon departed in the same fashion in which they arrived, without Matrice in tow. After attempting to leave the restaurant herself without paying the $89 bill, claiming the party she had joined said they would pay for it, the 21-year-old's disturbed mental state caught the eye of staff. As Matrice's voice carried over the cacophony of the surrounding conversations and cutlery, staff noticed that she was attempting to explain that things were actually, quote, subliminal. And witnesses recall that Matrice intonated that she was from Mars with the purpose of avenging Michael Jackson's recent death. Suffering from the sometimes catastrophic effects of bipolar disorder, Matrice was not normally this erratic in her behavior. Her incoherent and excitable rambling eventually led to an altercation with the called-upon police, resulting in her detainment. She was arrested and taken into custody for possessing less than an ounce of marijuana and failing to pay her bill. To begin the young woman's nightmarish experience, the responding officers separated Matrice from her phone, her purse, and her wallet as they were all in her vehicle, which was towed to an impound lot located on the Pacific Coast Highway, more than 10 miles from where she was locked in a holding cell of the Lost Hill Sheriff's Department while they called her emergency contact, her mother. When Matrice's mother spoke to the responsible officers, a conversation made over a recorded department line, she stated clearly her concern for her obviously unwell daughter's well-being and offered to pick her daughter up if they were planning on releasing her that night, as she didn't want her vulnerable and mentally unwell daughter free to walk about in an unknown location in the dead of night. On that recorded phone call, her mom says, quote, It's dark. She doesn't have a car and I don't want her wandering. When she is assured by the communicating officer that Matrice would in fact be held until morning, her mother again double checks that fact and goes on to make what would later turn out to be an ominously clairvoyant statement. Intending to express her uncertainty and fear in regards to her child's safety, Matrice's mother one more time asks the first responder if she should come get her daughter now or if it could wait until the morning, adding, quote, I would hate to wake up to a morning report. Girl lost somewhere and her head chopped off. Specifically responding to this morbid and unfortunately prophetic statement, the deputy on the other line assured Matrice's mother multiple times that she could wait until morning to come get her 21-year-old daughter. Unfortunately, contrary to what was explicitly told to Matrice's mother, the exact opposite happened, and the college graduate and beauty queen, a woman who was struggling with mental illness but who, by all accounts, had a promising life ahead of her which was yet to even fully begin, was suddenly and inexplicably released into the night at 12.28 a.m. Left to her own accord on the side of a dark road, with no phone, money, or any ability to get help, her car locked in a tow yard ten miles away, Matrice wandered. At around 6.30 a.m., just as the sun was beginning to crest over Malibu's million-dollar homes, Matrice seemingly sought refuge in the backyard of Bill Smith, a well-known local news anchor for KTLA. When Smith opened his window to inquire if he could help the young woman, Matrice reportedly told him that she was simply, quote, resting. The police were called. However, Matrice had already vacated the premises and was nowhere to be found. Although the police made a somewhat half-hearted attempt at searching for the young woman, they said she was already gone, lost to the impenetrable darkness of the canyon, and therefore out of their jurisdiction. Upon further media questioning and police canvassing for the then still missing 21-year-old, a Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department spokesperson defended the choice to release Matrice with no support or additional resources because, as he said, quote, 
She exhibited no signs of mental illness or intoxication. She was fine. She's an adult. This would be a statement in direct opposition to witness accounts from the night of the incident when Matrice was recalled by restaurant goers as manically disconnected, rambling about celebrity conspiracies, a clear indication to even a layperson that the young woman was at least temporarily mentally unwell. The department defended their actions, stating that Matrice had been invited to wait in the lobby, but had declined. However, this is again in direct opposition to what the officer had told Matrice's mother on the recorded line, when she called to inquire if she should come pick up her mentally unwell daughter in the middle of the night, or if they would be releasing her in the morning. The department could give no logical reasoning for their mistakes. Matrice Richardson's body was finally found 11 months after being negligently released into the night with no money, phone, or means of help. Her partially mummified remains were discovered by park rangers only one and a half miles from the Lost Hill Sheriff Station. Found near the creek bed in Dark Canyon, she was without her clothing near a suspected gang-organized illegal cannabis grow. Matrice's family and critics of the department's handling of this case find it highly suspicious that the investigators were so eager to rule her death as anything but that of a homicide. Some members of the force said that Matrice may have died of anaphylactic shock originating from acute exposure to poison oak, something which the media was quick to point out is not a statistical likelihood. Another theory purported by police is that Matrice wandered into Dark Canyon and died of venom poisoning from multiple rattlesnake bites, in what would be another statistical anomaly. More suspicious than their inability to come up with the cause of death is their absence of a reason for Matrice's lack of clothing. While investigators attempted to justify her nakedness as being that of a victim of scavenging animals, the media pointed out that her belt buckle had to have been unlocked and slipped out of the belt loops of her jeans, which is not exactly something animals are apt to do. Additionally, her socks and shoes were taken off and her underwear removed separately from the removal of her jeans, which seemed to also have been purposefully removed as opposed to chewed off by animals. Additionally, her bra, which had the classic two-hook clasp in the back, had been undone, not chewed away, but physically unfastened. The jeans, the belt, and the bra were all recovered, but further testing has not been released to the media. In 2011, in hopes of seeing some form of consequence for the irresponsible actions of the Sheriff's Department, the Richardson family privately settled a lawsuit with LA County for $900,000. However, no paltry sum of money can make up for a life lost. The family remains hopeful that new answers will come in the form of new evidence or newly brought forth witnesses. Another life tragically lost to the obscurity of Dark Canyon was Tristan Baudet. While taking the burden off his wife, who was attending to her academic needs of her final stages as a medical student, 35-year-old Tristan Baudet, a scientist from Irvine, took his two- and four-year-old daughters on a daddy-daughter camping trip. His brother was going to be moving out of the area soon, so they also used it as a chance to have one last hurrah. But nobody knew that it would end with such tragic finality because what should have been a joyous and memorable experience soon turned to disaster when, in the pre-dawn hours of what should have been a beautiful day, at 4.44 a.m., Tristan, who was sleeping shortly after a much-needed, long-awaited, and ominously fitting goodbye with his brother, was shot right through his tent directly in his head. His two girls, blood-soaked and terrified, were physically unharmed, although experts agree the psychological damage sustained is incalculable. The campground that they had reserved, highly rated and lauded by locals and tourists alike, the Malibu Creek State Park Campground, has since been closed. Police have not released any information about any potential motive, but there have been reports as far back as 2016 of gunshots in the area with a biologist camping at the same campground in November having awoken to a pain in his arm, which the hospital first attributed to an injury made by a rodent and administered a rabies shot, but which he later found bullet shards in and realized he had been shot at while he was sleeping. 
Additionally, other campers had previously reported being shot at as well, although there were no casualties. A Tesla was also shot at and had a window broken in the same area. The juxtaposition of it all was almost unfathomable. In 2019, Anthony Rauda, a parolee with a history of charges regarding local robberies, was arrested in October after being found supposedly with a gun in the Malibu Hills near the sheriff's station. Many close to the case, including unnamed sources directly on the force, are suspicious of the arrest and postulate the possibility of him being merely a scapegoat for the killing of the young father as they question why someone who was one of Malibu's most wanted would have continued to loiter in such close proximity to a law enforcement agency. No updates have been given about the status of his arraignment. Much to the frustration of family and locals alike, there have been no further updates in this murder, and it remains unsolved. Matthew Weaver was a 21-year-old living in Simi Valley, California. In 2018, he moved out of his stepmother's house in Simi Valley and into his own apartment in the Granada Hills. He moved in order to be closer to his new job, where he worked as a lineman for a telephone pole construction company. His father also worked at the same company. He had recently broken up with his girlfriend, but his family said he was already starting to move on and had recently made some new friends. On August 9th, Matthew picked up his check from the company and told his father that he was going to go hang out with a new female friend. Matthew then picked up the friend, Melissa Sanchez, from her house and both partied late into the night. Matthew dropped Melissa off at her home around 4.30 a.m. that morning. Ten minutes later, his phone records placed Matthew on Maholland Highway, heading towards the Malibu Canyons near Rose's Overlook. Between 5.45 and 6.24 a.m., he drove around Saddle Peak Road and Shurin Road. At around 6.30 a.m., he stopped at the parking lot at Stunt Road and Saddle Peak Road in Topanga Canyon and posted a Snapchat video of the view. Near the parking lot, there was a metal gate that blocked Topanga Tower Motorway, a dirt road which was usually closed to the general public. At 7.13 a.m., a CCTV camera captured his car driving on the Topanga Tower motorway towards Rose's Overlook. Around 7.30 a.m., it is believed Matthew reached the end of the trail in the area of Rose's Overlook. Then, three hours later, he called his friend Melissa, but as she was at work, she didn't answer the phone. She did, however, text him back to say that she was at work and asked, quote, what's up? Matthew replied in jumbled texted words, saying, quote, like some crazy is going on, shit going on, and quote, I just to talk while I have the chance. This would be the last time anyone heard from Matthew. His phone either ran out of battery or it was turned off after this conversation. Melissa replied an hour later, asking if he was okay, but Matthew never responded. Later, around 12 a.m., an individual called 911 after hearing what they believed to be a male and female voice crying out for help coming out of the area of Rose's Overlook. Police arrived at the scene and searched the road. They found Matthew's BMW in the area of Rose's Overlook above the Backbone Trail in Hondo Canyon. An immediate search of the area was launched. The next few days, the police searched the area thoroughly using cadaver dogs, helicopters, and volunteers, but nothing would turn up. After these initial searches, the police stopped taking interest in the case. Feeling as if the police were not taking the case seriously, family and friends of Matthew Weaver organized their own searches. And in addition to and independent from the efforts, or lack thereof, of the LAPD, in January of 2019, with the help of a land surveying company, Matthew's family took some aerial photos and videos. Using a drone, they captured footage of the area where Matthew had disappeared. They released these photos and asked the public for any help in the search. Soon, with the help of strangers, family found Matthew's hat a t-shirt with a rip on it, which seemingly contained a smear of what appeared to be blood, and his car keys, which have been confirmed as belonging to Matthew. The evidence was given to the search and rescue department at Malibu Lost Hill Station, and it remained in an evidence locker at the station for approximately three months. 
Repeated pleas by the family for the LAPD to come pick up the valuable evidence for testing was ignored. Finally, after the media got involved on the Weaver's behalf, the evidence was transferred to the LAPD, and the t-shirt containing blood was tested for Weaver Jr.'s DNA. But police relayed the disappointing and confusing information that multiple attempts at coding the DNA led to, quote, inconclusive results. The family is still hoping to get the entire incident report from the night Matthew went missing, but are being told by the LA Sheriff's Department and the CHP that they have no report from that night besides the initial 911 call. There have been no further updates in the case, and it remains unsolved. Elaine Park, 20, a dancer and underground hip-hop music superfan, was last seen leaving the house of her on-again, off-again boyfriend during the pre-dawn hours of Saturday morning, February 4th, 2017. Her exit was captured by CCTV footage and a license plate reader at the boyfriend's wealthy parents' upscale home. When she failed to come home, her mother notified police, and Elaine was officially reported missing on Monday, February 6, 2017. Three days later, five days from when Elaine was last seen on CCTV footage, Elaine's car was found, a charcoal gray 2015 Honda Civic, found at the Corral Canyon Road in Malibu, parked on the shoulder of the 26,000 block of Pacific Coast Highway. Her keys were still in the ignition and in the on position. The battery was dead. Elaine's cell phone and backpack were also in the car, which many say suggests she did not leave of her own accord. With absolutely no collection of her personal items for evidence processing, all of Elaine's belongings were given back to her mother. Her mom has reiterated that she washed and put away all of her daughter's belongings, so no further forensic analysis is possible. And while many believe the location of these four complex and unexplainable cases and their relatively proximal timing are too suspicious and coincidental to ignore, Recent events in the Elaine Park case have caused detectives to start moving away from the shadows of Dark Canyon in order to shine new light on the familial secrets of Elaine Park. And with the revelation of new information, investigative journalist Neil Strauss, host of the podcast To Live and Die in LA, has realized that maybe the focus should be on someone else entirely. Because due to data extracted from newly unearthed text messages, many close to the case believe that it is not the current nor the past lovers of Elaine who should be looked upon with suspicion, nor the handling or lack thereof of the case by authorities, but that the focus should be on a different player in the game entirely, one on their very own team, one who time and time again portrayed themselves as an advocate, tireless in their search for Elaine but one who may have been purposefully stalling and misleading investigators the entire time. The person that many close to the case began to suspect the most was not an ex nor some random stranger in the night, but Elaine's own flesh and blood. Stay tuned for part two of this rapidly developing case. <laughs> 